You are witnessing the most famous bridge failure in the history of the world. It is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which collapsed during a strong crosswind in November of 1940. The investigation into this failure employed the best brains in the free world in the fields of civil engineering, structures, and aerodynamics. The cause of this failure was determined to be aeroelastic. That is, a combination of two forces, one being aerodynamic and the other elastic. These forces, when combined in the proper phase relationship, can produce the results that you see here. After several years of analysis, testing in wind tunnels, and design and testing of dynamic models, it was determined that the primary cause of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Collapse was the effect of aerodynamic lift acting on the roadbed. Hello, I'm Al Richardson, President of Research Consulting. I'll be telling you today about the methods of controlling galloping by aerodynamic means. But first we have to go back and review a few fundamentals. You have seen the action of the Tacoma Narrows bridge galloping and it was stated that there we have the effect of aerodynamic lift. Let's see what makes that lift different from the normal lift of an airplane wing which can be shown in this graphic where the positive lift force is necessary to hold up the weight of the aircraft when it's being impinged by the wind coming uh, from this direction through this angle. Now this angle is so important in the field of aeronautical engineering that it's given a special name and it's called the angle of attack and we'll be referring to that during the course of this presentation. The airplane wing of course has a very smooth surface on the top and on the bottom so that the air flows smoothly over it without separation and develops a laminar flow so that there is pressure acting in this direction to hold the airplane up. Contrary to that, we have in the lower graphic a representation of the roadbed of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Uh, in that case, there was a flat girder plate and the bridge deck itself now here, uh, contrary to the airplane wing, when the wind comes through an angle of attack, the lift is found through measurements to be directed downwardly. And more importantly, as we will see later in the production of galloping motions, as this angle changes and increases, this lift increases in the negative direction. This led to a situation in which aerodynamic forces added energy to the oscillation and thereby caused it to grow with each cycle of vibration. situation that occurs in an overhead power line conductor is known as galloping. Well, you have just seen the disastrous effects that galloping uh, produced in the case of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. You also saw shortly thereafter some failures of structures produced by galloping on a transmission system. Here we will see in the next film clip the dynamic motions produced in actual galloping caused by ice. The ice shape may be but a few millimeters in thickness. It may in some cases be up to a half inch in thickness. The difference in thickness does not seem to be important. It is the shape of the ice coating which is important. Here we see a conductor simulated uh, with a small amount of ice formed on the front edge as a result of wind that comes in at this 
angle of attack. Again, notice that the angle of attack plays a very important role in the formation of the ice and also in the development of the lift here again going in the negative direction. Thus, there is a considerable similarity between the two cases. One, the vibration of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, and two, the galloping of the overhead power conductor. Notice that the power conductors on the left are galloping vigorously, even passing each other, while the power conductors on the right are not moving at all. This is not unusual. Not only must ice form on the conductor, but the angle at which the ice forms along the conductor span is an essential element in the generation of gallop. Another important factor in the condition required to produce galloping is the orientation of the ice itself along the span, uh, the full span length of the conductor. And uh, I will show here by means of a helpful graphic how this situation arises. Uh, imagine a, a catenary conductor, uh, which we're viewing it, sort of looking at the end of it, and then it fades off into the distance to its attachment point. And at this location, the ice is oriented, as I've indicated, and oriented with respect to the wind in uh, association with the earlier graphics that were used. Farther down the conductor, the ice orientation may be entirely different. While the wind direction, certainly over a flat terrain, would be more or less the same as it is here. But the angle now is totally different than it is here. The angle of attack range over the entire span length of a conductor could vary quite a bit. Now this effect alone would be sufficient to produce a case where no galloping would occur. Extensive wind tunnel tests have been performed on ice-coated conductor shapes. A typical measurement is shown here, illustrating that when the angle of attack changes, the lift represented by this solid line also changes. The lift for this particular shape initially increases, similar to the behavior of an airplane wing. The linear range of increase is limited to 10 degrees, however. After that, the lift abruptly changes direction and instead of increasing, now decreases sharply for further increases in the angle of attack. It is only within this steep negative gradient range that galloping can occur. We see this effect reflected in the lower graph, which gives negative values where galloping is possible. Notice that there is a large section of the upper graph from 40 degrees to 130 degrees where the lift is negative, yet in the bottom graph no negative numbers appear. This is because the drag, seen here as a dashed line, cancels the negative lift gradient. It is truly remarkable that the totality of ranges of angle of attack in which galloping can occur is really quite narrow. Being here in the range of 10 degrees at the low end of angles of attack and again being in the range of 10 degrees at the high end. Well, in the light of such a narrow range of angles of attack where galloping is identified, how is it possible that galloping occurs at all on overhead transmission lines? Being a natural phenomenon, one would expect that uh, random events would dictate and that uh, perhaps ice when forming on a conductor would do so in a non-uniform way. However, the events and the actual facts appear to contradict this. There are documented evidence. Uh, here is an example of uh, work that was done in 1979 reported by the Bonneville Power Administration in Portland, Oregon showing in the upper photo the accumulation of ice on a sample length of conductor. Notice that the ice is formed uh, on one side in a very uniform way and that uh, that uh, side is the windward side. Uh, beyond this, additional measurements were made and shown below in the uh, actual 
a bundled conductor uh, having a bundle of eight. Here again, the ice is shown forming uh, into the windward side and very, very uniformly disposed all along the conductor span. Thus, while the angle of attack range is narrow where galloping can occur, over flat terrain, nature conspires to produce disastrous results. This is seen from actual galloping records taken from the central region of the United States. Here we see a widespread pattern of galloping interruptions. The numbers in the circles are interruptions of electric power per day due to galloping. During this particular winter season, the number of customer hours lost due to galloping was 437,000. This therefore suggests a possible remedy uh, in terms of finding somehow with a device concept to disorient the ice. Now one way to do that would be, as we've indicated earlier uh, with this graphic, uh, attaching something to the conductor that would uh, disorient or reorient the angle of formation of the ice or even after it's formed, uh, disorient its uh, shape uh, by means of uh, wind. Now, uh, one device has been developed that actually does that, and it's called a wind damper. And a sample production model uh, four-foot length wind damper looks like this. And it's uh, constructed of uh, heavy gauge aluminum material, it consists of uh, two uh, suspension brackets, one at each end, and uh, its method of attachment to the conductor, below the conductor, is by means of uh, merely fastening suspension clamps uh, uh, in the reverse direction and attaching them to the wind damper with a heavy bolt. Under normal conditions, the wind damper would hang directly below the conductor. Having seen what a wind damper is, let's turn our attention now to what a wind damper actually does on an overhead transmission line conductor. And the uh, graphic here beside me will serve to illustrate a number of points. Uh, first of all, the outline of the wind damper shape is shown, and the uh, wind coming from this uh, direction and the angle of attack is shown as well, together with the outline of the conductor, which would have ice, and the uh, resultant force that is applied to the conductor by means of the wind damper at that particular point. Uh, one of the features of the wind damper attached to the conductor is as this angle of attack changes, the uh, change in the lift force and the uh, uh, vertical force on the wire is such as to be in a favorable direction for stability. Uh, remembering what we had said earlier about the uh, airplane wing as compared to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. That's one effect. Now another effect that happens is that as the wind increases, the wind damper actually has a tendency to increase its angle of blowback and thus uh, develop a relatively large twist angle, typically in the range of 20 degrees in a 20 mile an hour crosswind. Uh, I'd like to illustrate this point further by uh, merely moving to the wind damper and assuming that the wind now is coming towards me, uh, what aspect would the wind damper assume uh, as the wind increases? Well, it's just simply going to twist the conductor and move in that fashion. The wind, therefore, has a tendency to rotate the wind damper. And imagining that a conductor is running along parallel to it, you can see how uh, the uh, wind would have an effect on the ice shape that's uh, on the conductor, and thereby create a stabilizing influence in addition to those that were mentioned uh, in connection with the graphic. Well, so in summary then, we have two effects. One is the uh, desirable effect of twist, which acts to uh, disorient the ice shape itself and produce stability. Secondly, we have the aerodynamic force effect working on the conductor through the wind damper to produce a stabilizing influence. Since 1968, over 1,400 of these units have been installed by a total of nine utility companies on operating transmission lines of 69 kV, 
115 kV, 138 kV, 220 kV, 345 kV, and 500 kV. The wind damper works not only on single conductors, but on bundle conductors as well, as can be seen in this installation in the Netherlands. Note that when the line voltage is above 200 kV, the ends of the wind damper are treated with corona rings. It was mentioned uh, earlier that uh, the method of uh, galloping control that could also be effective might involve the use of a, a means of uh, confusing the ice as it actually forms uh, so that the uh, uh, formation along the span is neither uniform nor of the same thickness. And uh, there have been some methods developed in recent uh, times in the last five years that uh, will be described. One of them is a, um, a uh, uh, T2 conductor manufactured by Kaiser Aluminum and Chemical Company. Here, this illustrates the, uh, the actual conductor. Uh, two conductors are wound together over a helical path, and if ice is formed, uh, it will have a formation tendency uh, depending on how that particular uh, pair of conductors is oriented to the wind. Uh, see at this angle, the ice would be formed on this fashion, whereas at this other angle, the ice might form in this fashion, bearing in mind that the moisture is coming uh, with the wind from this direction. Now, if one were to examine these shapes in the wind tunnel, uh, it could be that the the lift force would be down in this case, up in this case, and up in this case, but with different rates. So that when one combines all of these effects over the entire span of the conductor, uh, the total integrated or added up effect over the entire span results in a conductor that uh, has a much less tendency to gallop than it would if it were left uh, in its normal way. Uh, since the development of the T2 conductor, there have been some other, uh, another method that's uh, come along is a, a spirally wound uh, add-on device. Uh, this is not the actual device that uh, is uh, marketed by Preform Line Products Company, but uh, uh, one could see that uh, using this uh, over an existing conductor would produce very similar effects in the spoiling of the ice as would a T2 conductor produce. The um, uh, actual, any method I would think that would interfere with the ice, even including a beaded chain wrapped around a single conductor, uh, so long as the chain is, uh, is non-ferrous, uh, maybe brass would be all right, I suppose, or even a plastic chain, if uh, uh, one could obtain that and wrap that around the conductor. Um, you can see the disorientation effect that uh, a chain might have. It, it probably would require um, the same uh, type of coverage, namely about 30% of the span. Uh, finally, another device that's uh, come into being, uh, actually was developed in Russia, is the uh, drag damper. And uh, this uh, employs a, a shingle effect below the conductor. It's extruded, uh, polyethylene. Conductor would be uh, carried inside of this slot. And as the wind uh, blows across uh, uh, the conductor, uh, the drag is uh, increased by the fact that the, uh, the large area is exposed to the wind. And it's well known that the high drag on a, uh, on a conductor will develop a uh, uh, stabilizing tendency. So that, again, 30% of the span or so would have to be covered uh, with that method. So that in addition to the uh, wind damper uh, and the effects that the wind damper uh, uh, was uh, shown to produce, there are other methods that employ different principles and uh, which uh, uh, seem to have a good deal of uh, merit regarding the uh, ability to interfere with the, with the ice shape. The wind damper has a long history of development and uh, one might say that the uh, fact that uh, 14 years of experience on transmission lines uh, is a sufficient uh, support of its effectiveness. Uh, one cannot 
overlook the fact that uh, research was done beginning back in 1960 at MIT under an EEI project uh, which I managed. These are the uh, blue documents shown on this table which uh, <coughs> represented the early efforts in the development of the wind damper although the wind damper wasn't known at that time. Later than that there were subsequently conference papers published by the uh, Power Engineering Society, uh, SIGRI papers written and published, and papers given at the International Conference of Wind Effects on Buildings and Structures. And in addition, most recently, there have been new papers published in the power apparatus uh, proceedings. Therefore, uh, in addition to the practical development of the device on the uh, grounds of manufacture and uh, testing, uh, there has been a good deal of the uh, fundamental engineering that has gone into it, even though the device itself is relatively simple. Further than the uh, testing of uh, the uh, wind damper device on the power lines in the Niagara Falls area, where a record of uh, performance there has been compiled, illustrating that previously that had been a number of flashovers in the range of several hundred after the dampers had been installed, no flashovers, whatever. This has the same effect of reducing the maintenance costs in switch yards for breaker operation attending flashover. Beyond that, there is work that was done at uh, Canada that has illustrated results here from Ontario Hydro showing amplitude of galloping, frequency of galloping occurrence for 290 observed reference spans without wind damper versus 72 treated spans with damper. Ratio between these two in the range of 14 to 1 as effectiveness factor. Uh, therefore, we're talking here about a device that's not only got a record unmatched in the industry for performance of, uh, and experience in terms of years and in terms of ability to control flashovers, but backed up by solid engineering a long line of research and observations that are unmatched. Now, in terms of further identification with what this device can do, there's nothing better than a visual impact of uh, its performing on an actual transmission line, and that's what will be seen in the next film clip. <laughs>